The audio you're about to hear was recorded in Anchor. Learn more at anchor.fm. Welcome back to the Alexander Schmidt Podcast, episode 032, Homer's Iliad, book 9, part 2. Last time we were talking about the famous embassy to Achilleia. So Agamemnon, in accordance with the will of the people, was feeling fairly poor, fairly down after the first Achaean loss during the entire Trojan War. And so he called an assembly. At that assembly, he listened to the wise advice of both uh, uh, Diomedes and Nestor after foolishly and in a rush himself suggesting that perhaps the Achaeans return back to their homes, but supporting as evidence the fact that Zeus seems to be behind the Trojans and who can defeat Zeus, who is too strong, who glories in his own strength. And so upon Nestor's advice to uh, assemble three champions, Aias the Greater, Phoenix, and Odysseus, in order to go to Achilleus, Agamemnon assents to that and in fact says that he must have been mad and uh, to listen to the persuasion of his heart's evil when he uh, when he first uh, admonished and took Perseus from the great man Achilleus. And in a kingly way, he offers Achilleus several gifts, uh, seven citadels, 20 uh, uh, women from Troy underneath the beauty of Helen, his one of his own daughters, um, seven citadels, uh, ten talents of gold, and and much else. It's quite a bit, except for, well, the problem is is that he can't give to Achilleus what Achilleus now longs for, and that is what Achilleus says in response to Odysseus against whom he's sitting when he makes this response. And so basically he says, well, <clears throat> even though you can give me many gifts back, in fact, you can give me Briseis back and have him lain with her, which uh, according to the normal rules of custom would suggest that you'd given me far more than you'd taken from me. What you actually took from me is my belief in our custom, uh, in our honor culture, in our current dominance hierarchy. You've taken away my belief in the structure and values of reality. And so I'm experiencing now uh, the dark night of the soul or, or the desert in Old Testament imagery. He, Achilleus, is now in a dark wood as Dante's pilgrim might be or has experienced a fall from grace like Milton's Lucifer. And so what do I mean there? Well, there's a distinction between the sun and, Lu- and Lucifer in Milton's Paradise Lost, and the distinction seems to be this, that both deal with being treated as less than God and illustrate how one might react to that in uh, two differing ways, which suggests that humans have two different ways to respond to being uh, treated like less than divine creatures, which, of course, seems to upset us because we do believe in the individual divinity of each person, which is why we all have individual rights protected by the Constitution. And so what are the two ways of looking at this? Well, the Achillean Luciferian way is this. He is mistreated by Agamemnon, and he says of all the people that could have been mistreated, who could have been, had their concubines or had something taken from them, Agamemnon took it from me, the top guy, the top individual. You can imagine Lucifer saying the top angel in this situation. And so he says, even though I'm so much more glorious than all, I get treated in the same way. I get treated just like I'm some human, some non-divine Entity. And so he turns from the dominance hierarchy because he understands that in the world, occasionally people get treated beneath their dignity. And so he turns his back on the world and on his own people. And it will take only um, a moment of tremendous and utterly desolate emotion to move him again. So certainly no rational reasons, no... Uh, no consciously constructed ideas are going to move him. Only uh, a deep-seated um, uh, and powerful uh, and tragic emotion will motivate him to come back. And so um, one might imagine that's the same idea as uh, Dante's Lucifer, who is sitting uh, trapped by his own tears, which he, well... His tears freeze around him and keep him immobile because of his impotent flapping of his wings, indicating that he he binds himself by his own unwillingness to change and by his swimming against the river of the absolute will. He completely immobilizes himself. And so, so does Achilleus. 
sitting in his tent, amusing himself with his lyre, not winning any of his glory. And so on the other hand, you might take more of a Hector or a, or the son or Jesus perspective from Milton's Paradise Lost, which is this. Well, that character also gets rather mistreated on earth, uh, you know, fairly poor, uh, birthing conditions amongst animals and then, you know, having to carry his own cross and, uh, get nailed to it while people watch is, uh, well, Dante at least makes the claim in the Paradiso that that's the most unjust thing that could possibly happen because the most just or fairest being ever to have existed comes down to earth, gets completely mistreated by these unworthy creatures, and so they c- commit essentially an unforgivable act, which is to be unjust creatures committing un- injustice against the justest or fairest creature in all the universe, which is an act from which those creatures could not repent. However, since the creature harmed was of superior nature or of, um, yes, of superior nature to those who did the harming because he forgives them, which is the ultimate act of charity because they in no way deserve that forgiveness, he sets the ideal for all eternity, which is to give even though the world will be unfair to you because it was even unfair to the divine. And so one might understand that that's more the ideal that Hector is pursuing right now because he's giving his life even though he knows that his people will fall, even though he knows that he's fighting a losing battle. Where Zacharias, who was fighting on the winning side and winning everything from one small slight has turned into a complete grinch and has turned completely against his own people so much so that he even calls in the will of Zeus to repair his damaged honor and to hurt his own people. And so one might recognize the fundamental conflict there as a Luciferian versus the Son or Jesus sort of one uh, and, and reflect that as the basic psychological reality of, of how a human deals with unfairness and injustice in the world. Does one become resentful and thus hate the world? Well, or does one accept it and still give as much as possible to the world, recognizing that, well, even within the major Greek and Christian stories, even God and even the gods get mistreated. And so, well, probably you will too. And so, though he may have been meant to speak first, we have Phoenix now launch into his response to Achilleus. And recall that each of the men was stricken to silence after Achilleus' response to Odysseus, where he said, please consider this response not personally, but as given to all, because this is what my heart has me say. For as I detest the doorways of death, so do I detest the man who keeps one thing in the depths of his heart and speaks forth another. And uh, also famously, uh Fate is the same for the man who holds back. <clears throat> the same if he holds hard. We are all held in a single honor. The brave with the weakling. And then mentions, of course, having sacked 23 cities. And uh, claims that Agamemnon taking his concubine is equivalent to Paris taking Menelaus's, um, um wife. And so the students often debate about that. I think it may be a level of abstraction issue, but potentially it is more. So, Phoenix, first and foremost, says that the whole reason he's here is because Peleus wanted to ensure that Achilles was educated in battle and in debate, indicating that he is mentor and teacher to Achilles. So what he says is, of course, in Achilles' best interest because he's there to groom Achilles. Um, and so he certainly will not leave Achilles behind regardless of the decision he makes. So he indicates that his loyalty to Achilles is supreme. Um, and so he truly does want the best because he's throwing his fate in with Achilles. And then, establishing even further credit, he, he, he tells us the story of his own youthful misjudgments, indicating that he doesn't feel any moral superiority to Achilles here. In fact, some inferiority because he... Well, he owes everything to Achilles, his father, for taking him in and out of his exile. And the reason he got exiled was from a major mistake, which was this. Basically, he, his father, Amentor, took a, mi- a mistress. And Phoenix's mom, well, she didn't much like this. And so she, she said, honey, Phoenix, please um, lay with your father's mistress so that he will dislike her and come back to me. And well, what could... Go wrong with that plan. 
Well, everything. Phoenix lays with the mistress, and the father finds out, and the father becomes upset, and the father has several of his goons from the family prepared to kill Phoenix, except for Phoenix has some lovely cousins who sleep side by side with him, essentially guarding him until he can be smuggled out. And so he's exiled, and so what does he do? He wanders until he finds a kingdom where there's a king who can expiate him in a holy way, and who does that happen to be? It's, well, it's Peleus, the father of Achilleus. And so Phoenix has been around Achilleus since he was a baby as well. He he mentions that Achilleus used to play on his knee. We've heard this before now. Uh, or we will hear this again when we hear about the suitors and just how insubordinate their relationships are to Odysseus, even the ones who, even one um, Eurymachus who grew up on the knee of Odysseus, he will conspire to lay with Penelope and kill Odysseus while he is gone, showing just how um, insufferable and un- ungrateful and what a little rat he is. And so, Phoenix indicates that he's known Achilleus since he was small, and he remembers giving him some small little wine, and how Achilleus would vomit on his tunic, tunic, and that was so cute. And so he's known Achilleus for quite a bit of time, and so not only is he there tethering his fate to Achilleus, not only is he there to give good advice, but he also clearly loves Achilleus, and so he has every reason why to say the right things to him, uh, to steer him correctly, not simply in his own interest. And so he says, I made you all that you are now and loved you out from my my heart, uh, lines 485 to 486. And <clears throat> then he even tells a story about prayer and ruin, which is um, an interesting story and one of two stories he tells. This is the shorter story. First he says that uh, prayers are the daughters of Zeus, but ruin runs out far ahead of prayers. And so prayers show up in unlikely ways after ruin, and if you turn them away, they will go to Father Zeus and make your ruin worse, which suggests that after poor or terrible things happen and you're, you're, you're forgetting that any good ever happened, that actually good restores itself into your life in, in small ways. And so it is to your own disadvantage to turn those small ways down, indicating that Phoenix can speak in an abstract language, in an analogical language to uh, Achilles, because, of course, he's suggesting that this is, of course, a good thing that's being offered to Achilles, that people are showing this sort of love to him, and he's being deferred to by Agamemnon, and that, in fact, Nestor, wisest of the Achaeans, has helped to come up with this sort of plan. And so... It is for Achilleus to limit the tragedy here and for a human to limit the tragedy and to recognize when good starts to set back in and to um, get their life back on course or to get his life back on course. And so Phoenix is offering top-notch wisdom to Achilleus here. And then he tells a very long story, which is another instance of Homer slightly changing mythology for his own purposes. It's the story of the Caledonian boar. In mythology proper, Greek mythology, the story of the Caledonian boar is, uh, where the, the, the famous heroine Atalanta has a chance to harm the boar and then after, um, Meliagros with two uncles, um, fells the boar, he, he chooses to give her its head. Well, his two uncles then very angrily, uh, insist that a woman cannot receive the head of the boar as trophy, and as Meliagros has forfeited his his right to the um, to the trophy, it should go to his two closest blood relatives, which are them. Um, he doesn't much care for their casuistry, and so he cuts off their heads. But this is a problem because then his mother, their their sister, finds out this has happened, and in accordance with the prophecy, she was told when um, Meliagros was young that um, a, a certain stick from branch of the tree will share his fate. Well, she had kept it safe until now, but now that he has killed his own flesh and blood, she, an inspired, sort of like a Furies act, takes out the branch and throws it into the fire, and Meliagros dies, and this is why Atalanta um, will take no man until she is defeated in a race. And that's the traditional story. But... Homer's version goes like this. 
There was a Caledonian boar, and it was a large boar that plucked up even trees, suggesting that it was of elephant size. And why was there this boar trying to destroy the city of the the Corotes, where the Aetolian, the Aetolians were, and Meliagros was prince? Well, it's because the king forgot to sacrifice to Artemis. And what does this suggest? That what this boar represents is some sort of plague, or some some sort of some sort of poor harvest. And so, and so, this needs to be fought on a spiritual, abstract level as well as on a physical level. And so, Meliagros defeats the boar, but a war breaks out. Um, and actually a funny thing written by Homer there is that after the big war, the small war occurs, which is even, even though the boar has been killed, of course, another war breaks out over who gets to keep the trophy from the killing of the, the boar, indicating that humans are in our capacity for conflict, just like Zeno's paradox of motion of the arrow moving towards the target. We're always striving for peace, but we can create a conflict out of nothing. A snake ends up in any garden or a golden apple is thrown into any uh, conflict uninvited shows up anywhere that's even in the Snow White uh, myth um, or Sleeping Beauty, excuse me, where um, danger is tried to be kept out of the castle. But of course, then even the smallest needle shows up and prick then she's injured, and I believe that's also the message behind the princess and the pea, uh, that if you try and just avoid all conflict and danger, uh, eventually it will find you in some way, no matter how comfortable you try and make yourself. So you should prefer to make yourself strong and adaptable rather than simply comfortable, because then uh, you adapt to your environment rather than simply adapting your environment to you. And so... The uncles of Meliagros, in this version anyway, claim the boar head is theirs. He kills them and his mom gets mad. Meliagros then refuses to fight until the towers burn, but then he receives no gifts. Um, and so the issue is that the priests come and the intelligent men of his people and they offer him something like 50 acres of land, uh, good land, uh, to come fight for them. And it, it's sort of a confusing story and told in a confused way if you read it, but uh, it's, it's sort of unclear why Meliagros becomes mad and refuses to fight after having taken vengeance on his his fathers, but it has something to do with his relationship to his mother, something to do with the fact that she chews him out as well, because later on she actually does come and uh, implores him to return, so it's unclear whether also this story sort of um, originally had more parts to it or is condensed from a larger version and there may be operant parts that we're missing out. Um, something um, said in the scholarship about or postulated in the co- scholarship about the Odyssey is that certain characters like Theoclymenus who sort of pop up out of nowhere and don't serve a large role um, may have existed in order to fulfill roles in other sort of side quests sort of additional episodes that Rhapsodes could add in for um, different regional audiences. There seem to be different parts of the Odyssey that you might, that a Rhapsode might have been able to add in or take out depending on time of year and where they were. And so that's very interesting. Uh, who knows how much we ended up uh, losing as the story codified into what it is, but surely the stories do have the best of what they currently are. And so... Well, the issue is that Meliagros doesn't fight until his wife, Cleopatra, which is the same name as Patroclus, backwards both mean glory of the father, Cleos and Patros. And so Meliagros doesn't fight until the walls are burning and his wife, Cleopatra, uh, finally convinces him that it's all or nothing by um, talking to him about the screams of children and describing women being led off and people burning alive as a siege takes place and horror overwhelms him is what one might say. And so he fights not from his own conscious decision and nobility, but be, but out of horror of enduring a siege. And so Phoenix is saying, listen, Achilles, you can be 
obstinate, but chances are you're going to fight anyway, and you might as well just fight now because you'll receive the most amount of glory possible. And you should really listen to me because I care about you on a personal level as well as on an intellectual level as well as on a vocational level since my life is essentially dedicated to yours. Take the gifts. In line 603 of Book 9, the Achaeans will honor you as an immortal. Well, that's a fine speech by Phoenix, and that's the longest speech, even longer than the one Odysseus gives, and so Achilles responds. <laughs> and, well, his tongue is sharp, and he's warned all the individuals here not to mind him on a personal level, and he says, you ought not to speak in favor of Agamemnon for fear that you do not turn hateful to me, Phoenix. And then showing that he doesn't quite have his aggression totally integrated, besides the fact that he can't turn his heart even with good reasons given to him, uh, which also indicates that his aggression is not yet any, uh, indicated or integrated. Excuse me. He says, you should hurt who hurts me, but stay tonight and we will decide tomorrow whether to leave or stay. And so two things there is that he immediately turns from his harshness towards Phoenix, towards affection, indicating to him that his natural reaction towards people does seem to be an aggressive conflict, Aries ridden, uh, 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 sort of way of attacking or his natural reaction towards people is aggressive and uh, often he snaps at even those he loves and he Patroclus even mentions this explicitly when he's trying to um, get information out of Nestor very quickly about who had left the battlefield when they when they seem to see Machaon the the healer get injured which means one of the two major healers gets knocked off the battlefield and that's bad bad news for the Achaeans and so uh, Patroclus will even let drop there. He says, for the, the one who sent me is one who gets mad even when there's no reason to get mad at people. And so, Achilles has snapped at Patroclus too, it seems, and snaps at all those he loves. And so, he indicates some knowledge of the fact that he can't restrain himself perfectly well here. And, um, tells Phoenix, yeah, why don't you stay over? And, but then he also shows some vacillation because now, rather than simply saying, that he's definitely going to leave, and if Poseidon is good to him, he'll get back to Phia in three days. He says, well, how about tomorrow? We'll decide whether we want to leave or stay. And so Aias the Greater gets his attempt to speak, but he immediately addresses Odysseus and says, well, Achilles has made his heart, his heart hard and pitiless, like Hades, the god of the dead, who takes no pity because he takes all souls into death and makes no exceptions. And so let us return with news to Agamemnon. And so he says, I don't exactly understand you, Achilles. The thing is, is that, you know, it was just a woman who was taken from you. And it's interesting that he says that because, of course, it, it was just a woman taken from Menelaus, and yet there's this giant war. So one could immediately uh, redress Aias's claim in that way. But he says, you know... A woman was taken from you, but even within our system, men accept repayment of the blood price. And the blood price is an actual price that one settles on for uh, giving to an aggrieved family member in order to settle a conflict so that it does not go on forever and ever and ever. And so he says men accept repayment of the blood price for killed children, brothers, but Achilles will not be placated for one girl, though he's offered seven and much more? Be gracious and know we desire your honor and love out of all Achaeans, Achilles. And I always think that that last mention is so interesting that all Achaeans wish for the favor of Achilles, indicating that he sort of is a Luciferian or Christ-like figure and that all wish for his favor, as if he were a divine uh, being or a god, um, indicating that he's the top of the dominance hierarchy. And yet, he turns away from bestowing this favor, though it, it would glorify him in a way no other gifts can. And he seems not to recognize this fundamental fact, and that ultimately is what limits his ultimate glory. Because he could, he has the chance in his existence, to give the ultimate charity. 
And everybody is telling him that he's the man to do it and that it will be the right thing to do for his destiny. And yet he vacillates and ultimately shows that his character is not strong enough to deal with the most minor of slights dealt to him by Agamemnon, as if Agamemnon has struck against his character a, a, a killing blow, which how does that strike Achilleus' character and not Agamemnon's? Well, because Achilleus should be strong enough of character, of mind, of mission, not to be completely destroyed in terms of, or not to let his value system crumble in the wake of one mistake by his lord Agamemnon. And yet, he's so small-minded that he refuses to see reason. In fact, he says, I, you're right, Aias, but my anger is unsatisfied, showing that unintegrated aggression, and I cannot stop thinking of him disgracing me, that I will not return until Hector threatens the ships of the Myrmidons, my ships with fire. And so that's yet sort of a third thing he's saying there. So not just has he said, well, we're going to sail away. And then he said, well, let's decide on whether we're going to sail away or not tomorrow. And well, I'll fight if Hector brings his flames all the way to my ships, sort of like when Meliagros was going to fight, even though, of course, he was fighting for home. And I'll just be fighting for, you know, this little piece of beach. And so, well, Odysseus and Aias leave. And, well, it's interesting because Achilles then goes to sleep with his concubine, Diomede, not Diomedes. <laughs> and uh, Patroclus and Hector, and Homer's very careful to mention this, well, he goes to bed with his own concubine. And something interesting in the Athenian tradition to follow after the Iliad is suggesting that Patroclus and Achilles uh, were lovers precisely because they, they do seem to have such affection for each other that they, they ask to be um, buried, to have their ashes placed in the same... Um, Earn, and I'll have some comments to make about that. But um, in Homer, at least, he's very clear to make sure the uh, to distinguish or to make the distinction, suggesting that Achilles and Patroclus have a platonic, though very close, relationship. Not as the Athenians will later suggest um, uh, in their play tradition. So Odysseus reports the failure in leading the people back, leading the embassy back to Agamemnon. And the fact that he leads it back suggests that reason is leaving the tent or wisdom is leaving the tent of Achilles, though Phoenix does stay behind. So now the fellowship of three has become two. So it's Aias, Might, and Odysseus, Reason returning back, but they don't have the special um, Joker card, Achilles, the trump card, one might say. And so as Odysseus reports, Diomedes again feels, speaks up. Not only did he speak up earlier when he told Agamemnon that he absolutely will not leave the fighting and um, that <clears throat> even if it were just he and Stenelus, they would still fight. Well, now he speaks up again. And in fact, <laughs> this will not be the last time that Agamemnon suggests all-out retreat after um, a discouraging moment. And that time... It will be Odysseus that calls himself hateful to Agamemnon. So it suggests that Agamemnon, as a symbol of order, must maintain his uh, his uh, forthright and stalwart stance moving forward in order to keep the dominance hierarchy or its two constituent parts, Diomedes and Odysseus, happy. And we mentioned earlier in an earlier lecture that Odysseus seems to represent the adaptive capacity to um, maintain a dominus hierarchy as Athena shows and that Diomedes and his actions and his improving battle strategies, his improved kills, his improved targets and his improved words and representation of the will of the people that he indicates the capacity to um, uh, increase one's status or increase one's confidence and move up the dominance hierarchy. And so uh, both Odysseus and Diomedes will end up getting angry at Agamemnon in moments of weakness, indicating that he is not performing his role correctly, seeing as their roles are completely uh, intertwined with his own, just as Hera and Athena are completely intertwined with the role 
of Zeus. They all must exist together, and that's why there must be some politicking, though Zeus, of course, is most powerful of all, since he represents power itself. But so Diomedes says that this was a foolish strategy, it turns out to be, and so he, he is in a way admonishing Nestor here, because recall that Nestor said earlier that, well, it was that Diomedes had spoken well in speaking against Agamemnon, but he had not completed what he had to say because he was too young, because he could even be Nestor's youngest son. And so he had something to learn from what Nestor had to say. And what did Nestor have to say? Well, let's put this embassy together. Well, did the embassy work? No. So Diomedes now is the first to say, hmm, well, I don't think that was the greatest idea because now it looks like we've just driven Achilleus further into his pride. Hmm indicating that he takes this moment not only to take a jab at Nestor, perhaps uh, jockeying for position, but also indicating his very real um, uh, uh, criticism of the results. So if he is currently representing the capacity to move up a dominant hierarchy, then, well, perhaps he's correct in having suggested, well, you know, maybe if Achilles just keeps watching and we keep ignoring him, and maybe the lack of attention will get under his skin eventually. And so now, now that we've gone back sniveling and groveling to him and offered him exactly what it was that he wanted, which was perhaps not the gifts, but the attention, um, well, perhaps we won't be capable of playing that card in the future. And so, um, it's unclear whether Diomedes is simply being critical of Nestor because he's been rubbed the wrong way by having been corrected, uh, in assembly by him or or that uh, Diomedes has, as a man of similar age to Achilleus and per- potentially fairly similar, though not certainly not the same temperament, perhaps he read the situation differently from the wiser old man, and he he understands perhaps how he would have reacted to the situation, and perhaps he he has fresher insight into the situation because of that. Well, in any case, that brings Book Nine to the to the close, and. Well, our next lecture will be on the famous book 10, The Dolanea, where we'll see Dolan, the opprobrious with five sisters, who's evil-looking. And, well, evil-looking, we recall Thersites when we hear that sort of language. And so, well, so many scholars believe that the Dolanea, because it's so odd and exists at night and seems episodic in nature, that it's an interpolation. But regardless of whether... It's original or not, we're going to be going through it and we're going to have a lot of fun doing it. And well, I often say that if you've been listening along and you get to the Dolanea and you're still interested or you're just now getting interested, I would say, well, this is the turning point of the text and this is when everything gets very, very interesting and things start to move very, very fast, books 11 through 16. So buckle up and well, This has been the Alexander Schmidt Podcast. Please share. Please like. Please comment. Please call in. This was episode 032, Homer's Iliad, book 9, part 2. Have a wonderful day. The audio you just heard was recorded in Anchor. Learn more at anchor.fm.